a rash of suicides plagues London, and another house is enshrouded in a dark mystery. Arthur Mackin, today on the Classic Tales Podcast. Welcome to the Classic Tales Podcast. Thank you for listening. We are proudly supported by our listeners. Many, many thanks to our financial supporters who pitch in every month to help us keep the lights on. If you enjoy the show, please sign up to be a supporter for as little as $5 a month. We'll give you a coupon code every month as a thank you. Go to classictalesaudiobooks.com and become a financial supporter today. The Crystal Stopper, the fifth installment in the Arsène Lupin series, is now available at classictalesaudiobooks.com. I've also uploaded around a dozen short stories from the archives that are now available. Works by Guy de Maupassant, Mary Fortune, Sax Romer, and Arthur Conan Doyle are ready when you are. You can find the new titles in the new category in the store. There are some times when you can see where you took a definite step from dumb to dumber. This is true confession time. I used to work in scenery, and we were doing some Bible movies, and we had to make a place look like ancient Jerusalem. We built a whole city. So we built buildings out of wood, clad them in two-inch white foam, and then my guys carved the foam to look like stone. Finally, we sprayed about three-eighths of an inch of concrete over the top, and then textured the concrete to look like stone. It was one of my all-time favorite projects. It really turned out great. So I was head of the crew, and I had to go around and check the previous day's work. I went around with a can of black spray paint, and I sprayed all of the places where there wasn't enough concrete. Places that gave easily when you tapped them, and you can see the foam. We had to go back and put more concrete there. Here's the thing. Instead of using a hammer like an intelligent person, or another tool designed to tap concrete appropriately, I decided to use just the bottom of the spray paint can. That way I had one tool I had to haul around with me all over the city. This decision is the step from dumb to dumber. What happened? You know what happened. I mean, you know. After about an hour of tapping on concrete with a spray paint can... I had worn out the bottom of the can. And so it exploded in my hand in a cloud of xylene-based black spray paint. People heard it and came running around to see if I was all right. They saw a big black cloud and then me stumbling around inside of it. Because what do you do when you're surprised? You gasp, right? So did I. But I gasped in two full lungfuls of black spray paint. And I was higher than a kite. They took me to the urgent care, and I was fine. Of course, when I walked in, painted black, talking way too loud and laughing way too much, they asked the obvious question. What were you doing? So yeah, my current job is much safer for my brain profile. That was such a bad idea. It was so dumb. Anyway, let's get on with our show. And now, the great god Pan. Part 2 of 3 by Arthur Mackin Four, the Discovery in Paul Street A few months after Villiers' meeting with Herbert, Mr. Clark was sitting, as usual, by his after-dinner hearth, resolutely guarding his fancies from wandering in the direction of the Bureau. For more than a week, he had succeeded in keeping away from the memoirs, and he cherished hopes of a complete self-reformation. But... In spite of his endeavors, he could not hush the wonder and the strange curiosity that the last case he had written down had excited within him. 
he had put the case, or rather the outline of it, conjecturally, to a scientific friend, who shook his head and thought Clark getting queer. And on this particular evening, Clark was making an effort to rationalize the story when a sudden knock at the door roused him from his meditations. Mr. Villiers to see you, sir. Dear me, Villiers, it is very kind of you to look me up. I have not seen you for many months. I should think nearly a year. Come in, come in. And how are you, Villiers? Want any advice about investments? No, thanks. I fancy everything I have in that way is pretty safe. No, Clark, I have really come to consult you about a rather curious matter that has been brought under my notice of late. I am afraid you will think it all rather absurd when I tell my tale. I sometimes think so myself, and that's just what made up my mind to come to you, as I know you're a practical man. Mr. Villiers was ignorant of the memoirs to prove the existence of the devil. Well, Villiers, I shall be happy to give you my advice, to the best of my ability. What is the nature of the case? It's an extraordinary thing altogether. You know my ways. I always keep my eyes open in the streets, and in my time I have chanced upon some queer customers, and queer cases too, but this, I think, beats all. I was coming out of a restaurant one nasty winter night about three months ago. I had had a capital dinner and a good bottle of Chianti, and I stood for a moment on the pavement, thinking what a mystery there is about London streets and the companies that pass along them. A bottle of red wine encourages these fancies, Clark, and I dare say I should have thought a page of small type. But I was cut short by a beggar who had come behind me and was making the usual appeals. Of course I looked round, and this beggar turned out to be what was left of an old friend of mine, a man named Herbert. I asked him how he had come to such a wretched pass, and he told me. We walked up and down one of those long and dark Soho streets, and there I listened to his story. He said he had married a beautiful girl, some years younger than himself, and as he put it, she had corrupted him body and soul. He wouldn't go into details. He said he dare not, that what he had seen and heard haunted him by night and day. And when I looked in his face, I knew he was speaking the truth. There was something about the man that made me shiver. I don't know why, but it was there. I gave him a little money and sent him away, and I assure you that when he was gone, I gasped for breath. His presence seemed to chill one's blood. Isn't this all just a little fanciful, Villiers? I suppose the poor fellow had made an imprudent marriage, and in plain English gone to the bad. Well, listen to this. Villiers told Clark the story he had heard from Austin. You see, he concluded, there can be but little doubt that this Mr. Blank, whoever he was, died of sheer terror. He saw something so awful, so terrible, that it cut short his life, and what he saw, he most certainly saw in that house, which, somehow or other, had got a bad name in the neighbourhood. I had the curiosity to go and look at the place for myself. It's a saddening kind of street. The houses are old enough to be mean and dreary, but not old enough to be quaint. As far as I could see, most of them are let in lodgings, furnished and unfurnished, and almost every door has three bells to it. Here and there the ground floors have been made into shops of the commonest kind. It's a dismal street in every way. I found number twenty was to let, and I went to the agents and got the key. Of course I should have heard nothing of the Herberts in that quarter. But I asked the man, fair and square, how long they had left the house and whether there had been other tenants in the meanwhile. He looked at me queerly for a minute, and told me the Herberts had left immediately after the unpleasantness, as he called it, and since then the house had been empty. Mr. Villiers paused for a moment. I have always been rather fond of going over empty houses. There's a sort of fascination about the desolate empty rooms, with the nails sticking in the walls, and the dust thick upon the window sills. But I didn't enjoy going over number 20, Paul Street. 
I had hardly put my foot inside the passage when I noticed a queer, heavy feeling about the air of the house. Of course, all empty houses are stuffy and so forth, but this was something quite different. I can't describe it to you, but it seemed to stop the breath. I went into the front room and the back room and the kitchens downstairs. They were all dirty and dusty enough, as you would expect, but there was something strange about them all. I couldn't define it to you. I only know I felt queer. It was one of the rooms on the first floor, though, that was the worst. It was a largish room, and once on a time the paper must have been cheerful enough. But when I saw it, paint, paper, and everything were most doleful. But the room was full of horror. I felt my teeth grinding as I put my hand on the door, and when I went in, I thought I should have fallen fainting to the floor. However, I pulled myself together and stood against the end wall, wondering what on earth there could be about the room to make my limbs tremble and my heart beat as if I were at the hour of death. In one corner, there was a pile of newspapers littered on the floor, and I began looking at them. They were papers of three or four years ago, some of them half-torn and some crumpled as if they had been used for packing. I turned the whole pile over, and amongst them I found a curious drawing. I will show it to you presently. But I couldn't stay in the room. I felt it was overpowering me. I was thankful to come out, safe and sound, into the open air. People stared at me as I walked along the street, and one man said I was drunk. I was staggering about from one side of the pavement to the other, and it was as much as I could do to take the key back to the agent and get home. I was in bed for a week, suffering from what my doctor called nervous shock and exhaustion. One of those days I was reading the evening paper, and happened to notice a paragraph headed, Starved to Death. It was the usual style of thing, a model lodging house in Marlebon, a door locked for several days, and a dead man in his chair when they broke in. The deceased, said the paragraph, was known as Charles Herbert, and is believed to have been once a prosperous country gentleman. His name was familiar to the public three years ago in connection with the mysterious death in Paul Street, Tottenham Court Road, the deceased being the tenant of the house number 20, in the area of which a gentleman of good position was found dead, under circumstances not devoid of suspicion. A tragic ending, wasn't it? But after all, if what he told me were true, which I am sure it was, the man's life was all a tragedy, and a tragedy of a stranger sort than they put on the boards. And that is the story, is it? said Clark, musingly. Yes, that is the story. Well, really, Villiers, I scarcely know what to say about it. There are no doubt circumstances in the case which seem peculiar. The finding of the dead man in the area of Herbert's house, for instance. The extraordinary opinion of the physician as to the cause of death. But after all, it is conceivable that the facts may be explained in a straightforward manner. As to your own sensations when you went to see the house, I would suggest that they were due to a vivid imagination. You must have been brooding, in a semi-conscious way, over what you had heard. I don't exactly see what more can be said or done in the matter. You evidently think there is a mystery of some kind, but Herbert is dead. Where then do you propose to look? I propose to look for the woman, the woman whom he married. She is the mystery. The two men sat silent by the fireside, Clark secretly congratulating himself on having successfully kept up the character of advocate of the commonplace, and Villiers wrapped in his gloomy fancies. I think I will have a cigarette, he said at last, and put his hand in his pocket to feel for the cigarette case. Ah, he said, starting slightly, I forgot I had something to show you. You remember my saying that I had found a rather curious sketch amongst the pile of old newspapers at the house in Paul Street? Here it is. Villiers drew out a small thin parcel from his pocket. It was covered with brown paper, 
and secured with string, and the knots were troublesome. In spite of himself, Clark felt inquisitive. He bent forward on his chair as Villiers painfully undid the string and unfolded the outer covering. Inside was a second wrapping of tissue, and Villiers took it off and handed the small piece of paper to Clark without a word. There was dead silence in the room for five minutes or more. The two men sat so still that they could hear the ticking of the tall, old-fashioned clock that stood outside in the hall. And in the mind of one of them, the slow monotony of sound woke up a far, far memory. He was looking intently at the small pen and ink sketch of the woman's head. It had evidently been drawn with great care and by a true artist, for the woman's soul looked out of the eyes, and the lips were parted with a strange smile. Clark gazed still at the face. It brought to his memory one summer evening long ago. He saw again the long, lovely valley, the river winding between the hills, the meadows and the cornfields, the dull red sun, and the cold white mist rising from the water. He heard a voice speaking to him across the waves of many years and saying, Clark, Mary will see the god Pan. And then he was standing in the grim room beside the doctor, listening to the heavy ticking of the clock, waiting and watching, watching the figure lying on the green chair beneath the lamplight. Mary rose up, and he looked into her eyes, and his heart grew cold within him. Who is this woman? he said at last. His voice was dry and hoarse. That is the woman who Herbert married. Clark looked again at the sketch. It was not Mary, after all. There certainly was Mary's face, but there was something else something he had not seen on Mary's features when the white-clad girl entered the laboratory with the doctor, nor at her terrible awakening, nor when she lay grinning on the bed. Whatever it was, the glance that came from those eyes, the smile on the full lips, or the expression of the whole face, Clark shuddered before it at his inmost soul and thought unconsciously, of Dr. Phillips' words. The most vivid presentment of evil I have ever seen. He turned the paper over mechanically in his hand and glanced at the back. Good God, Clark, what is the matter? You're as white as death. Villiers had started wildly from his chair as Clark fell back with a groan and let the paper drop from his hands. I don't feel very well, Villiers. I am subject to these attacks. Pour me out a little wine. Thanks, that will do. I shall feel better in a few minutes. Villiers picked up the fallen sketch and turned it over as Clark had done. You saw that? he said. That's how I identified it as being a portrait of Herbert's wife, or I should say his widow. How do you feel now? Better, thanks. It was only a passing faintness. I don't think I quite catch your meaning. What did you say enabled you to identify the picture? This word, Helen, was written on the back. Didn't I tell you her name was Helen? Yes, Helen Vaughan. Clark groaned. There could be no shadow of doubt. Now don't you agree with me, said Villiers, that in the story I have told you tonight, and in the part this woman plays in it, there are some very strange points. Yes, Villiers, Clark muttered. It is a strange story indeed. Strange story indeed. You must give me time to think it over. I may be able to help you or I may not. Must you be going now? Well, good night, Villiers, good night. Come and see me in the course of a week. Five. The Letter of Advice do you know, Austin, said Villiers, as the two friends were pacing sedately along Piccadilly one pleasant morning in May, 
Do you know, I am convinced that what you told me about Paul Street and the Herberts is a mere episode in an extraordinary history? I may as well confess to you that when I asked you about Herbert a few months ago, I had just seen him. You had seen him where? He begged of me in the street one night. He was in the most pitiable plight, but I recognized the man, and I got him to tell me his history, or at least the outline of it. In brief, it amounted to this. He had been ruined by his wife. In what manner? He would not tell me. He would only say that she had destroyed him, body and soul. The man is dead now. And what has become of his wife? Ah, that's what I should like to know, and I mean to find her sooner or later. I know a man named Clark, a dry fellow, in fact a man of business, but shrewd enough. You understand my meaning? Not shrewd in the mere business sense of the word, but a man who really knows something about men and life. Well, I laid the case before him, and he was evidently impressed. He said it needed consideration, and asked me to come again in the course of a week. A few days later, I received this extraordinary letter. Austin took the envelope, drew out the letter, and read it curiously. It ran as follows. My dear Villiers, I have thought over the matter on which you consulted me the other night, and my advice to you is this. Throw the portrait into the fire, blot out the story from your mind. Never give it another thought, Villiers, or you will be sorry. You will think, no doubt, that I am in possession of some secret information, and to a certain extent that is the case. But I only know a little. I am like a traveller who has peered over an abyss and is drawn back in terror. What I know is strange enough and horrible enough, but beyond my knowledge there are depths and horrors more frightful still, more incredible than any tale told of winter nights about the fire. I have resolved, and nothing shall shake that resolve, to explore no whit farther, and if you value your happiness you will make the same determination. Come and see me by all means, but we will talk on more cheerful topics than this. Austin folded the letter methodically and returned it to Villiers. It is certainly an extraordinary letter, he said. What does he mean by the portrait? Ah, I forgot to tell you, I have been to Paul Street and have made a discovery. Villiers told his story as he had told it to Clark, and Austin listened in silence. He seemed puzzled. How very curious that you should experience such an unpleasant sensation in that room, he said at length. I hardly gather that it was a mere matter of the imagination, a feeling of repulsion, in short. No, it was more physical than mental. It was as if I were inhaling at every breath some deadly fume, which seemed to penetrate to every nerve and bone and sinew of my body. I felt racked from head to foot. My eyes began to grow dim. It was like the entrance of death. Yes, yes, very strange, certainly. You see, your friend confesses that there is some very black story connected with this woman. Did you notice any particular emotion in him when you were telling your tale? Yes, I did. He became very faint. But he assured me that it was a mere passing attack to which he was subject. Did you believe him? I did at the time, but I don't now. He heard what I had to say with a good deal of indifference till I showed him the portrait. It was then that he was seized with the attack of which I spoke. He looked ghastly, I assure you. And he must have seen the woman before. But there might be another explanation. It might have been the name and not the face which was familiar to him. What do you think? I couldn't say. To the best of my belief, it was after turning the portrait in his hands that he nearly dropped from the chair. The name, you know, was written on the back. Quite so. After all, it is impossible to come to any resolution in a case like this. I hate melodrama, and nothing strikes me as more commonplace and tedious than the ordinary ghost story of commerce. But really, Villiers, it looks as if there were something very queer at the bottom of all this. The two men had, without noticing it, turned up Ashley Street, leading northward from Piccadilly. It was a long street, and rather a gloomy one. 
but here and there a brighter taste had illuminated the dark houses with flowers and gay curtains and a cheerful paint on the doors. Villiers glanced up as Austin stopped speaking and looked at one of these houses. Geraniums, red and white, drooped from every sill, and daffodil-colored curtains were draped back from each window. It looks cheerful, doesn't it? he said. Yes, and the inside is still more cheery. One of the pleasantest houses of the season, so I have heard. I haven't been there myself, but I've met several men who have, and they tell me it's uncommonly jovial. Whose house is it? A Mrs. Beaumont's. And who is she? I couldn't tell you. I've heard she comes from South America. But after all, who she is is of little consequence. She is a very wealthy woman, there's no doubt of that, and some of the best people have taken her up. I hear she has some wonderful claret, really marvellous wine, which must have cost a fabulous sum. Lord Argentine was telling me about it. He was there last Sunday evening. He assures me he has never tasted such a wine, and Argentine, as you know, is an expert. By the way, that reminds me, she must be an oddish sort of woman, this Mrs. Beaumont. Argentine asked her how old the wine was, and what do you think she said? About a thousand years, I believe. Lord Argentine thought she was chaffing him, you know. But when he laughed, she said she was speaking quite seriously, and offered to show him the jar. Of course, he couldn't say anything more after that. But it seems rather antiquated for a beverage, doesn't it? Why, here we are at my rooms. Come in, won't you? Thanks, I think I will. I haven't seen the curiosity shop for a while. It was a room furnished richly, yet oddly, where every jar and bookcase and table and every rug and jar and ornament seemed to be a thing apart, preserving each its own individuality. Anything fresh lately? said Villiers after a while. No, I think not. You saw those queer jugs, didn't you? I thought so. I don't think I have come across anything for the last few weeks. Austin glanced around the room from cupboard to cupboard, from shelf to shelf, in search of some new oddity. His eyes fell at last on an odd chest, pleasantly and quaintly carved, which stood in a dark corner of the room. Ah, he said, I was forgetting. I have got something to show you. Austin unlocked the chest, drew out a thick quarto volume, laid it on the table, and resumed the cigar he had put down. Did you know Arthur Mayrick, the painter, Villiers? A little. I met him two or three times at the house of a friend of mine. What has become of him? I haven't heard his name mentioned for some time. He's dead. You don't say so. Quite young, wasn't he? Yes, only thirty when he died. What did he die of? I don't know. He was an intimate friend of mine and a thoroughly good fellow. He used to come here and talk to me for hours. And he was one of the best talkers I have met. He could even talk about painting, and that's more than can be said of most painters. About eighteen months ago, he was feeling rather overworked, and partly at my suggestion, he went off on a sort of roving expedition with no very definite end or aim about it. I believe New York was to be his first port but I never heard from him. Three months ago I got this book, with a very civil letter from an English doctor practising in Buenos Aires, stating that he had attended the late Mr. Mayrick during his illness, and that the deceased had expressed an earnest wish that the enclosed packet should be sent to me after his death. And that was all. And haven't you written for further particulars? I have been thinking of doing so. You would advise me to write to the doctor? Certainly. And what about the book? It was sealed up when I got it. I don't think the doctor had seen it. It is something very rare. Merrick was a collector, perhaps? No, I think not. Hardly a collector. Now, what do you think of these I knew jugs? They are peculiar, but I like them. But aren't you going to show me poor Merrick's legacy? Yes, yes, to be sure. The fact is, it's rather a peculiar sort of thing, and I haven't shown it to anyone. I wouldn't say anything about it if I were you. There it is. Villiers took the book and opened it at haphazard. It isn't a printed volume, then, he said. No, it is a collection of drawings in black and white by my poor friend Mayrick. 
Villiers turned to the first page. It was blank. The second bore a brief inscription which he read. Silet per diem universus, nec sine horore secretus est, lucet nocturnis inibus, chorus agipanum undice personator, audiuntur et cantus tibiarum, et tinitus simbalorum por orum maritimam. The whole day is silent, nor is it secreted without horror. It shines on fires at night, and the chorus of the Aigipani is resounded on every side. On the third page was a design which made Villiers start and look up at Austin. He was gazing abstractedly out of the window. Villiers turned page after page, absorbed, in spite of himself, in the frightful Valpurgis night of evil, strange, monstrous evil, that the dead artist had set forth in hard black and white. The figures of fauns and satyrs and Egypons danced before his eyes. The darkness of the thicket, the dance on the mountain top, the scenes by lonely shores, in green vineyards, by rocks and desert places, passed before him. A world before which the human soul seemed to shrink back and shudder. Villiers whirled over the remaining pages. He had seen enough. But the picture on the last leaf caught his eye as he almost closed the book. Austin. Well, what is it? Do you know who that is? It was a woman's face, alone on the white page. Know who it is? No, of course not. I do. Who is it? It is Mrs. Herbert. Are you sure? I am perfectly sure of it. Poor Merrick. He is one more chapter in her history. But what do you think of the designs? They are frightful. Lock the book up again, Austin. If I were you, I would burn it. It must be a terrible companion, even though it be in a chest. Yes, they are singular drawings. But I wonder what connection there could be between Merrick and Mrs. Herbert, or what link between her and these designs. Ah, who can say? It is possible that the matter may end here, and we shall never know. But in my own opinion, this Helen Vaughan, or Mrs. Herbert, is only the beginning. She will come back to London, Austin, depend on it. She will come back, and we shall hear more about her then. I doubt it will be very pleasant news. 6. The Suicides Lord Argentine was a great favourite in London society. At twenty, he had been a poor man, decked with the surname of an illustrious family, but forced to earn a livelihood as best he could, and the most speculative of moneylenders would not have entrusted him with fifty pounds on the chance of his ever changing his name for a title, and his poverty for a great fortune. His father had been near enough to the fountain of good things, to secure one of the family livings. But the son, even if he had taken orders, would scarcely have obtained so much as this, and moreover felt no vocation for the ecclesiastical estate. Thus, he fronted the world with no better armor than the bachelor's gown and the wits of a younger son's grandson, with which equipment he contrived in some way to make a very tolerable fight of it. At twenty-five, Mr. Charles Aubernon saw himself still a man of struggles and of warfare with the world. But out of the seven who stood before him in the high places of his family, three only remained. These three, however, were good lives, but yet not proof against the Zulu Asagai and typhoid fever. And so one morning Aubernon woke up and found himself Lord Argentine, a man of thirty, who had faced the difficulties of existence and had conquered. The situation amused him immensely, and he resolved that riches should be as pleasant to him as poverty had always been. Argentine, after some little consideration, came to the conclusion that dining, regarded as a fine art, was perhaps the most amusing pursuit open to fallen humanity, and thus 
his dinners became famous in London, and an invitation to his table a thing covetously desired. After ten years of lordship and dinners, Argentine still declined to be jaded, still persisted in enjoying life, and by a kind of infection had become recognized as the cause of joy in others, in short, as the best of company. His sudden and tragical death, therefore, caused a wide and deep sensation. People could scarcely believe it, even though the newspaper was before their eyes and the cry of, mysterious death of a nobleman, came ringing up from the street. But there stood the brief paragraph. Lord Argentine was found dead this morning by his valet under distressing circumstances. It is stated that there can be no doubt that his lordship committed suicide, though no motive can be assigned for the act. The deceased nobleman was widely known in society, and much liked for his genial manner and sumptuous hospitality. He is succeeded by etc., etc. By slow degrees the details came to light, but the case still remained a mystery. The chief witness at the inquest was the deceased's valet, who said that the night before his death, Lord Argentine had dined with a lady of good position, whose name was suppressed in the newspaper reports. At about eleven o'clock, Lord Argentine had returned and informed his man that he should not require his services till the next morning. A little later, the valet had occasion to cross the hall and was somewhat astonished to see his master quietly letting himself out at the front door. He had taken off his evening clothes and was dressed in a Norfolk coat and knickerbockers and wore a low brown hat. The valet had no reason to suppose that Lord Argentine had seen him, and though his master rarely kept late hours, thought little of the occurrence till the next morning, when he knocked at the bedroom door at a quarter to nine as usual. He received no answer, and after knocking two or three times, entered the room and saw Lord Argentine's body leaning forward at an angle from the bottom of the bed. He found that his master had tied a cord securely to one of the short bedposts, and after making a running noose and slipping it round his neck, the unfortunate man must have resolutely fallen forward, to die by slow strangulation. He was dressed in the light suit in which the valet had seen him go out, and the doctor who was summoned pronounced that life had been extinct for more than four hours. All papers, letters, and so forth seemed in perfect order, and nothing was discovered which pointed in the most remote way to any scandal, either great or small. Here the evidence ended. Nothing more could be discovered. Several persons had been present at the dinner party at which Lord Argentine had assisted, and to all these he seemed in his usual genial spirits. The valet, indeed, said he thought his master appeared a little excited when he came home, but confessed that the alteration in his manner was very slight, hardly noticeable indeed. It seemed hopeless to seek for any clue, and the suggestion that Lord Argentine had been suddenly attacked by acute suicidal mania was generally accepted. It was otherwise, however, when within three weeks three more gentlemen, one of them a nobleman, and the two others, men of good position and ample means, perished miserably in almost precisely the same manner. Lord Swanley was found one morning in his dressing room, hanging from a peg affixed to the wall, and Mr. Collier Stewart and Mr. Harry's had chosen to die as Lord Argentine. There was no explanation in either case. A few bald facts. A living man in the evening, and a body with a black swollen face in the morning. The police had been forced to confess themselves powerless to arrest or to explain the sordid murders of Whitechapel. But before the horrible suicides of Piccadilly and Mayfair, they were dumbfounded, for not even the mere ferocity, which did duty as an explanation of the crimes of the East End, could be of service in the West. Each of these men who had resolved to die a tortured, shameful death was rich, prosperous, and to all appearances, in love with the world, and not the acutest research could ferret out any shadow of a lurking motive in either case. There was a horror in the air, and men looked at one another's faces when they met, 
each wondering whether the other was to be the victim of the fifth nameless tragedy. Journalists sought in vain for their scrapbooks for materials whereof to concoct reminiscent articles, and the morning paper was unfolded in many a house with a feeling of awe. No man knew when or where the next blow would light. A short while after the last of these terrible events, Austin came to see Mr. Villiers. He was curious to know whether Villiers had succeeded in discovering any fresh traces of Mrs. Herbert, either through Clark or by other sources, and he asked the question soon after he had sat down. No, said Villiers. I wrote to Clark, but he remains obdurate, and I have tried other channels, but without any result. I can't find out what became of Helen Vaughan after she left Paul Street, but I think she must have gone abroad. But to tell the truth, Austin, I haven't paid much attention to the matter for the last few weeks. I knew poor Harry's intimately, and his terrible death has been a great shock to me, a great shock. I can well believe it, answered Austin gravely. You know, Argentine was a friend of mine. If I remember rightly, we were speaking of him that day you came to my rooms. Yes, it was in connection with that house in Ashley Street, Mrs. Beaumont's house. You said something about Argentine's dining there. Quite so. Of course, you know it was there Argentine dined the night before... before his death. No, I had not heard that. Oh, yes. The name was kept out of the papers to spare Mrs. Beaumont. Argentine was a great favourite of hers, and it is said she was in a terrible state for some time after. A curious look came over Villiers' face. He seemed undecided whether to speak or not. Austin began again. I never experienced such a feeling of horror as when I read the account of Argentine's death. I didn't understand it at the time, and I don't now. I knew him well, and it completely passes my understanding for what possible cause he, or any of the others for the matter of that, could have resolved in cold blood to die in such an awful manner. You know how men babble away each other's characters in London. You may be sure any buried scandal or hidden skeleton would have been brought to light in such a case as this. But nothing of the sort has taken place. As to the theory of mania, that is very well, of course, for the coroner's jury. But everybody knows that it's all nonsense. Suicidal mania is not smallpox. Austin relapsed into gloomy silence. Villiers sat silent also, watching his friend. The expression of indecision still fleeted across his face. He seemed as if weighing his thoughts in the balance, and the considerations he was resolving left him still silent. Austin tried to shake off the remembrance of tragedies as hopeless and perplexed as the labyrinth of Daedalus, and began to talk in an indifferent voice of the more pleasant incidents and adventures of the season. That Mrs. Beaumont, he said, of whom we were speaking, is a great success. She has taken London almost by storm. I met her the other night at Fulham's. She is really a remarkable woman. You have met Mrs. Beaumont? Yes. She had quite a court around her. She would be called very handsome, I suppose. And yet there is something about her face which I didn't like. The features are exquisite, but the expression is strange. And all the time I was looking at her, and afterwards, when I was going home, I had a curious feeling that very expression was in some way or another familiar to me. You must have seen her in the row. No, I am sure I never set eyes on the woman before. It is that which makes it puzzling. And to the best of my belief, I have never seen anyone like her. What I felt was a kind of dim, far-off memory, vague but persistent. The only sensation I can compare it to is that odd feeling one sometimes has in a dream, when fantastic cities and wondrous lands and phantom personages appear familiar and accustomed. Villiers nodded and glanced aimlessly round the room, possibly in search of something on which to turn the conversation. His eyes fell on an old chest, somewhat like that in which the artist's strange legacy lay hid beneath a gothic scutcheon. Have you written to the doctor about poor Meyrick? 
he asked. Yes, I wrote asking for full particulars as to his illness and death. I don't expect to have an answer for another three weeks or a month. I thought I might as well inquire whether Meyrick knew an Englishwoman named Herbert, and if so, whether the doctor could give me any information about her. But it's very possible that Meyrick fell in with her at New York or Mexico or San Francisco. I have no idea as to the extent or direction of his travels. Yes, and it's very possible that the woman may have more than one name. Exactly. I wish I had thought of asking you to lend me the portrait of her which you possess. I might have enclosed it in my letter to Dr. Matthews. So you might. That never occurred to me. We might send it now. Hark, what are those boys calling? While the two men had been talking together, a confused noise of shouting had been gradually growing louder. The noise rose from the eastward and swelled down Piccadilly, drawing nearer and nearer a very torrent of sound, surging up streets usually quiet, and making every window a frame for a face, curious or excited. The cries and voices came echoing up the silent street where Villiers lived, growing more distinct as they advanced, and as Villiers spoke, an answer rang up from the pavement. The West End horrors! Another awful suicide! Full details! Austin rushed down the stairs and bought a paper and read out the paragraph to Villiers as the uproar in the street rose and fell. The window was open and the air seemed full of noise and terror. Another gentleman has fallen a victim to the terrible epidemic of suicide which for the last month has prevailed in the West End. Mr. Sidney Crashaw of Stoke House, Fulham, and King's Pomeroy, Devon, was found after a prolonged search hanging dead from the branch of a tree in his garden at one o'clock today. The deceased gentleman dined last night at the Carlton Club and seemed in his usual health and spirits. He left the club at about ten o'clock and was seen walking leisurely up St. James Street a little later. Subsequent to this, his movements cannot be traced. On the discovery of the body, medical aid was at once summoned, but life had evidently been long extinct. So far as is known, Mr. Crashaw had no trouble or anxiety of any kind. This painful suicide, it will be remembered, is the fifth of the kind in the last month. The authorities at Scotland Yard are unable to suggest any explanation of these terrible occurrences. Austin put down the paper in mute horror. I shall leave London tomorrow, he said. It is a city of nightmares. How awful this is, Villiers! Mr. Villiers was sitting by the window, quietly looking out into the street. He had listened to the newspaper report attentively, and the hint of indecision was no longer on his face. Wait a moment, Austin, he replied. I have made up my mind to mention a little matter that occurred last night. It stated, I think, that Crashaw was last seen alive in St. James Street, shortly after ten. Yes, I think so. I will look again. Yes, you are quite right. Quite so. Well, I am in a position to contradict that statement at all events. Crashaw was seen after that, considerably later, indeed. How do you know? Because I happened to see Crashaw myself at about two o'clock this morning. You saw Crashaw? You, Villiers? Yes. I saw him quite distinctly. Indeed, there were but a few feet between us. Where, in heaven's name, did you see him? Not far from here. I saw him in Ashley Street. He was just leaving a house. Did you notice what house it was? Yes. It was Mrs. Beaumont's. Villiers, think what you are saying. There must be some mistake. How could Crashaw be in Mrs. Beaumont's house at two o'clock in the morning? Surely, surely you must have been dreaming, Villiers. You were always rather fanciful. No, I was wide awake enough. Even if I had been dreaming, as you say, what I saw would have roused me effectually. What you saw? What did you see? Was there anything strange about Crashaw? But I can't believe it. It is impossible. Well, if you like, I will tell you what I saw, or if you please what I think I saw. You can judge for yourself. Very good, Villiers. The noise and clamour of the street had died away, though now and then the sound of shouting still came from the distance, and the dull, leaden silence 
seemed like the quiet after an earthquake or a storm. Villiers turned from the window and began speaking. I was at a house near Regent's Park last night, and when I came away, the fancy took me to walk home instead of taking a hansom. It was a clear, pleasant night enough, and after a few minutes I had the streets pretty much to myself. It's a curious thing, Austin, to be alone in London at night, the gas lamps stretching away in perspective, and the dead silence, and then perhaps the rush and clatter of a hansom on the stones, and the fire starting up under the horse's hoofs. I walked along pretty briskly, for I was feeling a little tired of being out in the night, and as the clocks were striking two, I turned down Ashley Street, which, you know, is on my way. It was quieter than ever there, and the lamps were fewer. Altogether it looked as dark and gloomy as a forest in winter. I had done about half the length of the street when I heard a door closed very softly, and naturally I looked up to see who was abroad like myself at such an hour. As it happens, there is a street lamp close to the house in question, and I saw a man standing on the step. He had just shut the door, and his face was towards me, and I recognized Crayshaw directly. I never knew him to speak to, but I had often seen him, and I am positive that I was not mistaken in my man. I looked into his face for a moment, and then, I will confess the truth, I set off at a good run, and kept it up till I was within my own door. Why? Why? Because it made my blood run cold to see that man's face. I could never have supposed that such an infernal medley of passions could have glared out of any human eyes. I almost fainted as I looked. I knew I had looked into the eyes of a lost soul, Austin. The man's outward form remained, but all hell was within it. Furious lust and hate that was like fire, and the loss of all hope and horror that seemed to shriek aloud to the night, though his teeth were shut. And the utter blackness of despair, I am sure that he did not see me. He saw nothing that you or I can see, but what he saw I hope we never shall. I do not know when he died, I suppose in an hour, or perhaps two, but when I passed down Ashley Street and heard the closing door, that man no longer belonged to this world. He was a devil's face I looked upon. There was an interval of silence in the room, when Villiers ceased speaking. The light was failing, and all the tumult of an hour ago was quite hushed. Austin had bent his head at the close of the story, and his hand covered his eyes. What can it mean? he said at length. Who knows, Austin? Who knows? It's a black business, but I think we had better keep it to ourselves, for the present at any rate. I will see if I cannot learn anything about that house through private channels of information and if I do light upon anything, I will let you know. This is B.J. Harrison. I hope you've enjoyed this unabridged production of The Great God Pan, Part 2 of 3, by Arthur Mackin. If you've enjoyed this book, please become a monthly supporter by going to ClassicTalesAudiobooks.com. Donate $5 a month, and you get a monthly coupon code for $8 off anything in the store. Give more, and you get more. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for joining me today, and allowing classic literature to awaken your better self. Please join me every week, and we'll rediscover the greatest stories ever put to paper. <laughs>